this presentation uh, focuses on uh, two pilot projects that were originally identified under the CAVI, under the, the um, basic species in the Caribbean program, but actually weren't carried through to completion for a couple of reasons, which I'll, I'll explain in the presentation. But um, it was, we, we were invited uh, by the Ministry of Environment in the Dominican Republic and by CABI to assist with this um, right at the very beginning, back in 2010, um, to assist um, to, uh, to develop a sort of feasibility assessment as to whether invasive vertebrates could be eradicated from, from these two particular islands. Um, so really I'm sort of speaking a little bit on behalf of the ministry who's represented here by Carlos Rio and Senor Mateo and I'm sure they'd be very happy to answer some questions and talk to you more about the islands. Um, I know Carlos himself has been to those islands many times. Um, so, but f before I launch into that, I, I just wanted to um, just clarify a few um, uh, things about islands and, and invasive species eradications, um, because it's been, uh, we've, we've been discussing some of this um, yesterday and today, um, and I wanted to make sure we understood what we were trying to achieve. Um, island conservation itself focuses on islands and on invasive vertebrate eradications from islands. That's our sort of niche. And the reason we do that is because as you all know, islands are hotspots of endemicity. Um, the very small proportion of the, 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 the planet's sort of terrestrial area, but they are home to high a number of endemic species, and also they're very, those species are very vulnerable, um, and they're most of the global, most species uh, globally, most of the extinctions of those species have, have happened on islands. But you can eradicate, um, and um, globally more than 1,500 eradications have occurred on small islands and this has really led to uh, success or recovery of, of species as, as Ulrika explained um, just previously. Um, this is actually the Antiguan racer, a sort of a comparable species to the St. Lucian racer, also extremely uh, rare. This is the Great Bird Island um, in Antigua, the only uh, home for the Antiguan racer before eradication of rats um, from other islands in Antigua and that uh, species has now been translocated to at least four other islands and has uh, um, really uh, gained ground. I think there's about 500 individuals now up from you know, less than 50, so 10, 15 years ago. So we were asked to um, help assess the uh, feasibility of removing invasive species, removing invasive vertebrates from Isla Altavello and Catalina. And I just wanted to sort of um, demonstrate what, what that is. Um, so what were, we were, what were we trying to do? And essentially, the feasibility assessment is, is to understand why are you going to do this? Uh, and ultimately, you know, we, we're interested in, in uh, the recovery of biodiversity, but you need to clarify why do you want to actually eradicate uh, these invasive vertebrates? Can you actually do it? And we'll talk about that in a minute. And what's it going to take? How much money? How much effort? How long? Um, you've got to sort of evaluate that. And this is, this is, uh, these sort of processes, these, these items here are, are um, important in the actual planning process. And just to clarify, and again, we talked about this a bit yesterday, but um, as I think Arnett was saying, these terms have been used or are being used a little bit loosely. Um, there is a huge difference between eradication and control, and it's very important for the planning processes, which I'll show you in a minute. Eradication is complete removal. Um, and most times, you can only really do eradication on relatively small islands, relative being, you know, in terms of um, terrestrial, of area of continents. Um, some, there are some islands that are fairly sizable that you, where goats or donkeys and stuff have been eradicated, but most of the time they're relatively small islands, offshore islands. Uh, control is a long-term sustained effort and that's typical, for example, on the, in Jamaica for the Jamaican iguana, um, typical on, on much bigger islands um, and in, in, in continents. And they're, they're very different concepts. And this is the reason why they're different. And this is important in our, in our feasibility assessment, is understanding can we do this? Eradication specifically is very time limited. You need to remove animals. You want to be able to remove animals within a specific time frame, usually one year or two years or even shorter than that. Control, you will do forever. And that's really important because you have to plan for that. And so you have to know how much is it going to cost to maintain, to, re to keep mongooses and cats and dogs to reduce their populations forever to protect the Jamaican iguana. 
And as I think was fantastically explained with the cane toad program, with eradication you have this incredibly short term, really high intensity effort. And um, in that cane toad program, um, Janine demonstrated, they threw everything at it. They targeted all life stages. And that's really important. For control, it's long term. So you need to have the field, you need to have a team to be able to manage that uh, program long term. And you have costs on control forever. So these things are really important in the planning process and being able to understand um, whether eradication is actually feasible. If you, if you decided that eradication is feasible, these are some of the things that you actually need to satisfy. And particularly this one, which is what we're talking about today, is, which is immigration and biosecurity. So you shouldn't, there should be real no sort of immigration, no reinvasion of your um, target species into your, uh, onto your island, or you can manage it really, really effectively. But also, most importantly, is you need to be able to remove the animals. Um, can you hit, is, do I have to have this this close? Or, yeah, I have to have this this close, okay. Um, you are able to remove the, you need to be able to remove the animals more quickly than they can breed. If you don't, it's a control program. So you've got to, and, and um, you'll have that sort of long-term sustained, sustained effort, you'll need a long-term sustained effort. These other things are more practical. Um, every single animal of your target species needs to be able to be removed. You need to better have a method that can target every single animal. And I think again with the cane toad program, she demonstrated that because they, uh, we're targeting all different life st stages, then um, you're able to put that species at very high risk of being able to be completely removed. And just to put this into context, like I said, there are about 1,500 um, eradications globally, but only about 6%, we've got about 100, just over 100 eradication events in our database, only about 6% have been carried out in the Caribbean. So there's relatively little capacity here in the Caribbean for eradications. Um, some, of your, uh, some of the countries that have done really well, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, and Antigua and Barbuda, um, St. Lucia's there, that's where your skills, your local skills are. Those are people you could go to to get advice. Should also note that um, actually down here in the Caribbean, the uh, eradication success rate is actually a little bit lower than in temperate regions, and that's partly, it's about 70% overall, and that's partly due to the differences in, in trying to do eradications in tropical environments. So these are the two islands that we were asked to assist with. This is Altavelo. Um, this is Hispaniola here, and uh, Altavelo is right down here. Altavelo is a relatively small island, about 150 hectares, and it's contained within the Aragua uh, National Park and within a, a much larger biosphere reserve here. So it's, um, it's a really, really important area. It was the, um, well, it still is actually, uh, the uh, largest city turn breeding colony in the Caribbean. Even though it's much reduced, there's probably about 30, 40,000 pairs there, probably reduced from oh, half a million, I should think, uh, primarily due to cats, cats and goats, and also guano mining in the 1800s, but currently they're really heavily impacted by cats. It also has at least three single island endemic reptiles on it, so only found on Altavelo, on this um, 150 hectare island. It is, uh, like I said, it is uh, a, pr a protected area. Back in the 70s, there were actually about 13 odd different seabird species reported from there. Um, but I think currently the main breeding, the main species remaining now is the sooty tern. This is the other island, uh, Catalina, very different type of island. Um, this is located off here in the, in the east side. As you can see, it's very close to shore. This is uh, the main population of La Romana. It's about 900 hectares or so. Um, also has a couple of um, sort of subspecies, endemic subspecies of lizards. Um, but its primary um, biodiversity importance is for nesting Hawksbill sea turtles, probably about 25% of the Dominican Republic's um, po population of Hawksbill turtles breed on, on Catalina. But it is a very, very popular tourist destination, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. It's also a protected area. Um, it's a, um, a national monument. And this little chap here, which is one of the two endemic mammals remaining on Dominican Republic, we don't know that it's on Catalina. There have been various, um, various sort of reports of potential sign, but it still needs to be confirmed if it is there or not. And even if it isn't, it could be a potential home for that 
that species. So this is why, why are we doing this? Um, this is Catalina Island. Catalina has five different invasive vertebrates, including raccoon, which are fairly, it's the only place in, in Dominican Republic where you have an introduced raccoon. And this is what happens. These are young turtles um, with their heads chewed off. And that is probably raccoon. So it's a major, major impact on the hawksbill turtles. They also, it, Catalina also has cats, rabbits, mice, and rats. On Altavelo Island, like I said, large seabird, uh, large city tern colony, globally important, um, the largest in the Caribbean, and uh, feral cats introduced probably 100 years ago, um, make large inroads into the city tern population. Estimates in the 50s, I think, were about 350,000 odd pairs of city terns. Now you're down to about 30,000, uh, probably. So um, that's why we're doing it also. It also has actually uh, three endemic reptiles on, only found on Altavelo. So our initial assessment um, of these two islands, and because we're in the biosecurity sort of um, presentation um, session, I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on, on the, the biosecurity issues. Um, but our initial assessment and why we didn't follow through with these two, while well, these two pro projects weren't followed through um, under the CABI program, um, for Altavelo, uh, we realized that it was going to be very expensive because of the, the, um, the remoteness of the island. And for Catalina, because of the very high tourism uh, visitation, the um, risk of reinvasion, particularly of rodents, was going to be very high. And it needed a lot of outreach, a lot of um, buy-in from tour operators that actually manage the the tourist concessions there and bring tourists to the island. The other issue with Catalina was that there had actually been very, very few, if almost, you know, one or two successful raccoon eradications in the world. So we don't actually have the methodology yet um, well worked out for, for raccoon eradication. And although I think we could probably do it, it's a pretty large island and it would probably require quite a lot of um, money and effort to, uh, to, to work out those, those methods that are needed and, and a little bit of sort of field trials and trial and, effort, trial and error uh, to work out as a suitable strategy. So those are the sort of two main reasons, or three main reasons, why these programs weren't followed through. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about those in a bit more detail. This is Catalina, as I said, very high uh, visitation rate, probably about 100,000 tourists a year or more. And um, um, as you can see, uh, it was very close to the mainland. Um, it has uh, very regular access. There are four major tourist concessions um, that, that uh, uh, manage. They have sort of a whole load of infrastructure and buildings and, and um, little tour shops and restaurants and canteens and everything um, for, for tourists. And the tourists come over on these big boats from the mainland. So the chance of an accidental reintroduction on these boats um, is, is pretty high. And so in order to address this issue, you'd need to really work with the tour operators and to have a, a fairly major program. They would need to buy into it. You would have to have a fairly major um, sort of uh, outreach program and management program with the tour operators and with the tourists to get them to understand why, um, we, why they might need to go through various procedures to, before they get on the boat, such as checking their bags or um, checking the boats to make sure there are no stowaway rats. The other potential risk for Catalina is actually, a, I've called it assisted reinvasion, it's sort of natural reinvasion. What we realized is, and, and you know, what people were telling us, is that actually there are three fairly sizable rivers uh, here just, um, and this is a fairly built up area, um, fairly sizable rivers here, and what was happening seemingly is that a whole lot of garbage is, is when it rains particularly heavily, a lot of garbage which is accumulating in the rivers all the way up in the mainland is just being flushed down out into the sea, and a lot of it landing up on Catalina. Um, this isn't us at all, I found a local group um, that actually run pretty regular volunteer programs there from La Romana up here, um, to clean up some of the beaches on Catalina and this is them at, at work. And just their most recent one, in a two hour period, they picked up about 3,000 pounds of garbage. And that, that, that is 
um, that's basically uh, your route for rodents. So rodents will float on top of some of this stuff on 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 um, plastics and within these sort of big um, sort of rafts of of garbage vegetation. So this is a, a fairly serious concern, and people have talked already about um, probably the you know a couple of the ways that you might need to address that is um, through rapid response. Um, so if there was a major, major heavy rainfall, um, to have a rapid response unit to go out and, and uh, put out uh, traps for rats or bait for rats. And also to manage the garbage so that it doesn't build up, so that if rats do get there, um, they won't have a lot of food to live on um, and then sort of re-establish the island. But again, that's a fairly major, uh, a major barrier to, to, to uh, removing at least rats from, from, from Catalina Island and needs significantly more work. However, there was a lot of um, opportunities at Catalina, and one of the things that we um, were informed of when we first started out um, assessing this project was that actually raccoons were a tourist attraction. And we thought, hmm, tourist attraction? I mean, they're, they're cute and cuddly looking, but they're actually pretty nasty animals, and they carry really nasty diseases. Um, so, by chance, um, we were involved in, um, um, with the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, who was mentioned this morning, we were involved in a, a training course that they did or a workshop in 2011 in the Dominican Republic, and some of the ministry um, employees were, were part of that. And one of our little, we did a little field trip to Catalina to, uh, to, to assess whether this was the case. And so the, the group, there's about 20 of them in the, in the workshop, we actually interviewed tourists on, on Catalina to understand, you know, do they like to see raccoons? The other thing, of course, is raccoons are largely nocturnal, and the tourists are here in the daytime, so we weren't even sure if they were seeing raccoons. And the interesting thing is, this is actually about 50% of people. So one of the questions we asked is, what do you want to do when you get to Catalina Island? And about 50% of the people wanted some sort of island experience. They wanted to walk around it, they wanted to dive or snorkel and look at marine life, or they wanted to see animals. And when we asked, what animals have you seen? Most of them said, they haven't seen any animals at all. Um, and also, we wanted to understand what sort of animals would you like to see. And this, is, this actually came out really quite surprising to us. But all four of these, except for the raccoon, the rest of them are all, natives, are all native species. And of course, iguana is up there. And there actually aren't iguanas. This is the big um, Dominican Republic iguana, the rhinoceros iguana. There actually aren't iguanas on the island. And a lot of the tourists that were interviewed were local, and they already have an understanding of iguanas, and they're quite familiar with iguanas. So another potential for Catalina would be actually to translocate some iguanas onto Catalina Island, and in addition it could become a refuge, a predator-free refuge for iguanas, as well as providing a tourist, uh, a tourist sort of attra attraction. A lot of people wanted to see turtles, um, and of course the, the raccoons and the cats are eating young turtles, so the chances of those populations decline, declining and, 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 and making a poorer experience for the, for the tourists. So there's a lot of opportunity there to develop some sort of ecotourism alongside um, the, the, um, the vertebrate uh, eradications. And I should say too that the tourists are actually very heavily managed and they're only allowed to uh, go in, in along the one beach. They actually aren't allowed to wander all over the island. So there is some opportunity there to actually have some tours, some, some sort of guided tours where they could be shown these different species. Um, and given the number of tourists that go there, it's a real outreach opportunity. Um, Altavelo Island is a very, very different uh, reason why uh, that also wasn't, wasn't um, taken through to, to, to completion under this program. And that's primarily because it's remoteness. So if you remember, it's, uh, this is one of the, the southernmost peninsula in the Dominican Republic. You have a very large island here, which is also quite uh, biologically important. And then this is Altavelo right out here. The nearest um, sort of port when you can access the island is, is from here or from here, and this is at least 30 kilometers, and that's a pretty remote sea. Um, there's quite a, it's a long way in, in a boat. Even from Isla Bayata, where there is a fishing camp and there's a navy base, it's about 16 kilometers, 15, 16 kilometers. So even operating from there, which is probably what we would do if we did erad invasive bird invas eradication from Altavelo, we would probably have an operations base on Isla Bayata because it is the closer point. Um, but there are, you know, small boats. I know Carlos has been in these small boats many times, but the ministry also does have a pretty sizable boat that would need to be used. But just the logistics of, um, the com complex logistics of a very remote location basically meant it was going to be very expensive. 
the biosecurity issues there, the potential for reinvasion is very different. I mean, it's pretty, pretty low. Um, these folks are actually fishermen from the fishing camp on, on Beata. But currently we're working with the local group, Group Aragua, and they're actually doing some uh, questionnaires for the fish, with the fishermen to understand how often they visit the island and what sort of biosecurity risk they may pose, particularly in terms of rats. So a quick summary. Um, those are the, the, the main issues for us um, in order to address in order to be able to move forward with some of these, some, with, the, with these projects. Um, and we're actually, um, we've actually, while, while they, these weren't completed under, the, under this um, Jeff program, um, we've actually, our island conservation itself, are, are taking some of these projects forward with the ministry and with some local, local non-profits. On Isla Catalina, um, we, we're sort of interested in this because of its potential for, for outreach and because of the raccoon issue. So as I say, raccoons aren't on the mainland uh, Dominican Republic. They are non-native to the Caribbean. They have huge impacts elsewhere in the world where they have been introduced. And they've been introduced to many countries in Northern Europe, um, even in Japan. They eat anything, uh, maybe even more than cane toads. They will just feed on anything. They're non-specialist predators. They're generalist omnivores. They have extremely high reproductive rate. And the potential for them to do significant damage on the island of Hispaniola, should they ever get established there, is, is, is huge. And it's something that really needs to be considered. Um, there are reports of raccoons being held as pets on the Dominican Republic. And uh, I think that is um, it's a serious concern for, for Hispaniola's biodiversity. For Altavello, uh, we, Island Conservation and Ministry, and Group Aragua, a local nonprofit, um, were successful in getting a CPF uh, project, um, CPF funding this year, to, or last year, to um, continue for operational planning to remove uh, rats, cats, and goats from Isla Altavello. Um, and we are we're in the middle of that that project at the moment, um, and that basically will uh, tell us. You know a lot of the methodology we need um, and how much it's going to cost and uh, um, put in a place a sort of recovery monitoring program in addition to the endemic reptiles and the sooty terns we're also interested in it as a potential home for black cat petrels now, as you may know black cat petrels is uh, the only petrel pretty much in the in the in the caribbean region critically endangered um, only known to breed on in in haiti um, but seen offshore of altavello um, and is uh, certainly a potential home for, for breeding black cat petrels. And again, it would be a predator-free um, island, and petrels being burrow nesting are very susceptible to, to um, uh, impacts of cats and dogs and mongooses and things. So we're very excited about this, and I'm sure, as I said, um, Carlos and Senor Mateo may be able to talk to you more about this project, um, but we're looking forward to some developments on that. So with that, I'd just like to thank, uh, thank uh, the various people who have been involved um, in this, um, in particular the Ministry, have been hugely supportive. We have another project um, uh, which with the Ministry and, and um, Island Conservation, which I'll be talking a bit about tomorrow. Uh, but these uh, two projects were also assisted by the Nature Conservancy, by the Natural History Museum, um, Grupo Aragua and Zudom, and, and INTEC is an um, um, academic institution in the Dominican Republic. Thank you.